Hello Year 6! Hey! Ah, we've missed you so much. We hope you've had a really, really lovely Easter break um, and have had a go at some of the challenges that Mrs Pilkington have put together for you. Uh, Mrs Perry and I have been very busy over our Easter break ourselves and we have been putting together these learning videos for you to get along with at home. So this is the first one today, Ooh, Monday the 20th of April. Ooh, um, <laughs> So we hope you enjoy them. Got a little few bits of lessons that you would have in normal school, um, all put into a lovely video for you to crack on with. Now every video will be released every each day, and each video has a PDF document alongside it. So somewhere on the internet there is a PDF document that has got lots of pieces of writing, or extra math problems, or extra bits of work, or text a link to the lessons on the video on it. So before you begin any video each day, make sure you've got that PDF document. You don't have to print it out to work from it, you can just have it up on your computer, but have it available so you can pause the video at any time and refer to that PDF document, because there'll be things on there that you can zoom in on and read properly that you won't be able to do off a video. So please make sure you've got that with you. Also, make sure that you're using the full capabilities of this video. So at different times we will ask you to pause so you can think about things or have some time to work out some answers to some problems that we'll give you, but that doesn't have to just be at those times. If you've not quite heard something, or you've not quite understood something, or you'd like something repeated, or you want to pause something to go and check something else out on the PDF, or to just quickly Google something, you can do. That's absolutely fine as long as it's to school. That's absolutely fine. So pause it, rewind it, replay bits that you need, um, make sure you're using the full capabilities of this video because obviously in class you'll be able to ask questions instantly and get an instant response. Um, but here you can rewind things and listen to them again, which is another really helpful thing that you might not be able to normally do in class. Um, or you can ask questions, but I don't visibly rewind and start again. So um, there's some benefits to this home learning as well. If you do have any questions or you would like to share some home learning with us, please feel free to email us at year6 at redbrickhays.staffs.seh.uk. We've been loving your emails so far, um, but please especially do this if you've got any questions or you'd like a bit more clarification or you'd like some extra work possibly um, or extra practice of certain skills. Drop us an email and we will try to reply to you as soon as we can um, and get a response to you that you wanted. So, without further ado, today's date is Monday the 20th of April, 2020. Might be helpful to write that down in your book or on a piece of paper, wherever you're working into or onto, um, to keep all of your work organised. So, jot that down in case you need to refer back to it at any point, um, and enjoy the video. Have fun! Okay, my lovelies. So, each video will start with a slide that looks like this, and it overviews the learning for the day on each video. So as you can see today we're going to start with some reading like we do in usual class when we're all sat together. Um, so you've got a lovely text called Tom's Midnight Garden. Unfortunately I couldn't come and hand out all of the hard copies that we bought just before we all disbanded but Mrs Pilkerton has been very kind and has put them onto a PDF document for you. So make sure you've got a hold of that PDF document um, as that's got the chap chapters on that you need to read um, to answer the questions that are on the video. So have a hold of that somewhere. Mrs Perry has also done for you a lovely maths lesson uh, on arithmetic and ordering decimal numbers. And then we move on to spag. Woo, everybody, so is spag. Um, we'll be reviewing relative clauses. And then we move on to our English. So um, before the whole isolation and home learning began, we had just started, just opened our writing judgment window. So we'd started writing lots of big pieces that would go towards our end of year judgment on our writing. So we talked about this in class, how we'd have a portfolio of writing that I'd need to look through and Mrs Pilkington and possibly a moderator would look through and decide um, a final end of year grade on your writing. Now that window is still open, so any writing that you produce at home, 
through our English lessons, I would like a copy of, whether you email it or send me a really high resolution photograph of that writing, that would be wonderful. Because any writing that you produce now can still go towards that final um, judgment. So put lots and lots of effort into all this learning, but especially your writing, because that can go towards your end of year judgment. So um, we're going to be starting a new genre today on the video. And in our connected curriculum, we're also going to be starting a new topic because it's after Easter. So we would be starting a new topic normally in school. So make sure you've got your date down and uh, enjoy. For your reading today, you will need to read the first two chapters of Tom's Midnight Garden. When you've read it, there are some questions for you to write the answers to. So you're going to pause this and read two chapters of Tom's Midnight Garden. Here are the questions for you to answer from the reading that you have done. Pause the video while you do your work and when you restart you'll be able to see the answers. Here are the answers to your questions. You'll be able to see how you got on with this today. For maths today we're going to start with a skills practice. There are 10 questions for you to try into your book or onto a piece of paper and you'll be able to see the answers in the next part of this video. Here are the answers to your maths questions. How did you get on today? We're now going to think about comparing decimal numbers. Which do you think is biggest, 0 0.2 or 0 0.09? The biggest is 0 0.2. That's because uh, in that number you've got two tenths and in 0 0.09 there are no tenths at all. And because tenths are bigger than hundredths, two tenths are bigger than nine hundredths. Which is biggest, 0 0.07 or 0 0.3? The answer is 0 0.3 because tenths are bigger than hundredths. So the 0 0.3 has three tenths but the 0 0.07 has no tenths at all. So 0 0.3 is the biggest because tenths are bigger than hundredths. And finally, which is biggest, 2.89 or 3.1? The answer is 3.1 because three units are bigger than two units. And because units are bigger than tenths or hundredths, it doesn't really matter how many tenths or hundredths you've got, units are the biggest things there. So the key to working this out is to bear in mind what's the biggest thing you've got each time, remembering that tenths are bigger than hundredths and so on. Here are some questions for you to try into your book or on a piece of paper. You're going to put the greater than or the less than sign between these pairs of numbers. The answer to these questions are number one is less than, number two greater than, number three less than, number four less than, number five greater than, number six less than and number seven less than. How did you get on with your questions today? Using this same idea of comparing the size of the numbers, you should now be able to order some decimal numbers. You're going to put these numbers into order from smallest to biggest. So that's ascending order from smallest to biggest. Pause the video while you do your work and the answers will be on the next page. Here are the answers to your ordering decimals. How did you get on with those today? Okay, and then that brings us on to our SPAG session for today's lessons. So, because we've had our SATs coming up and we've been working our absolute socks off, um, we have gone over all of the points on the grammar curriculum that we need to know for Year 6. So, we're going to treat these lessons like we would be doing if we were still doing our SATs, by using them as revision sessions. So, we're going to go over a lot of different techniques and sentence structures and word classes and use of punctuation and spelling that we have already covered in class. 
but instead of helping us towards our SATs test, this is going to be helping you towards your year seven English lessons and beyond. When you get up to high school, you will be needing um, the skills to be able to identify these different elements within sentences and to be able to explain why authors use them and to be able to use them yourself. So we're going to start with relative clauses because I know that confuffles a few of you. Um, so we'll keep revisiting this back. Um, you can keep going back to the same video if this helps. Um, and hopefully that will give you a bit of a clearer idea as you move up to high school and beyond, which makes me feel so sad. So we're going to move away from that idea. So starting with relative clauses, I'm going to start with a simple sentence. Okay, so my simple sentence has one subject and it has a verb and it makes sense by itself. So in the sentence, Tom was reading a book, the subject is... Tom, because that's who or what we are talking about. And the verb is reading. So that is the action that is happening within the sentence. Now, it's a valid, simple sentence. It makes sense. It's got a subject and a verb. Yeah, but it's so basic. I want to know more. As a reader, I'm going to need a bit more information than this. So I'm going to enhance it. Oh, OK. Two simple sentences, one after the other. Oh, Miss Tucker, this is a little bit boring. Tom was reading a book. Tom was in the garden. How can I upskill this? If I was to write this down in my writing, my reader would be going, oh, my goodness, Miss Tucker, how repetitive. Do you not know how to add variety to your writing? And I'd say, oh, OK, I'll give it a go. Because when we are authors and when we're writing, we need to be thinking about adding variety, making our sentences a little bit jazzier, upskilling everything. If I was to write a whole story about Tom reading his book in a garden in simple sentences where I can't even be bothered to change Tom and swap him out for the pronoun he, it's going to be a very dry book, OK? So I'm going to enhance it. I'm going to take that second sentence, Tom was in the garden, and I'm going to embed it. I'm going to tuck it into bed in the middle of the first sentence. Have a look. Oh, look at this for a jazzy sentence. Tom, who was in the garden, was reading a book. Ah. Okay, so first things first, we notice the bit that is underlined, mainly because it's underlined. But second of all, because it is in a pair of commas. So this tells me that this is a form of parenthesis. All happy with parenthesis, maybe? So parenthesis is an embedded clause in the middle of a sentence that doesn't need to be there. I can read around it and imagine it wasn't there and it would still make sense. Have a look. Tom was reading a book. Still makes sense without the clause in the middle. Um, but it's adding extra detail. It's enhancing our writing. So a relative clause is a type of parenthesis. But it's a little bit different. And we're going to look at why in now. OK, so I've got my sentence with my relative clause embedded into it. Now, if I look at this, I can see that the bit that is outside of the commas is my main clause. It still makes sense when I read it around the relative clause. Happy with that? The bit that's underlined is my relative clause. It is my example of parenthesis, which is really an example of a fancy subordinate clause. It doesn't make sense by itself. If I read that by itself, who was in the garden, it's not a full sentence. It's not one full idea. I don't know who was in the garden. I don't understand who we're referring to if I don't have the main clause around it. Now, what makes it a little bit special from any other subordinate clause or any other piece of parenthesis is that it starts with the relative pronoun who. This relative pronoun refers to the main clause. And it's it's linking to Tom, to my subject. Does that make sense? So the who, if I say who, it's Tom. OK, that relative pronoun is linking to the subject of my main clause. If I look at it as two sentences, if I take that pronoun that I've swapped for the second Tom, so Tom was reading a book, 
he was in the garden. We know we can use pronouns to swap for people's names or groups of people to make our sentences a little bit less repetitive. And I've just basically swapped that for a relative pronoun. Does that make sense? So I've taken the two sentences, Tom was reading a book, he was in the garden. I've swapped my pronoun for a relative pronoun that links back to it. So if I say who was in the garden, you'd say he was in the garden, Tom, yeah? Um, and I've popped it into a, a fancy version of parenthesis in the middle of my sentence. So instead of having two simple sentences, one after the other, I've enhanced my writing. I've added a bit of variety, a different sentence structure that makes it more engaging and interesting for my reader to read. If I had a whole paragraph of simple sentences, it would be yawn city. But because I've thought, right, I need to enhance it a little bit. I need to add a little bit of flavour. I've rearranged my sentence structures to make a different type of sentence. And that then, as the reader reads through a paragraph of uh, complex sentences, compound sentences, simple sentences, maybe uh, a compound sentence with a semicolon in the middle instead of a conjunction, it starts to add that variety. And it makes reading a bit more exciting and a little bit less monotonous and boring. Okay, so on the last slide, we looked at the relative pronoun who, and we swapped that for the word he. We can also swap it for she. Um, but we're also going to look at some different relative pronouns now that you will need to know uh, and to be able to identify as relative pronouns. So I can have the relative pronoun which. Now, which swaps with the pronoun they. So if I look at that as an example, I've got minnows swim in shoals. They are a small type of fish. I'm going to take that second sentence. I'm going to embed it in the first sentence and I'm going to swap the pronoun they for the relative pronoun which. So I'm going to enhance it. I'm going to add a bit of flavour. So minnows, which are a type of small fish, swim in shoals. So the clause, which are a type of small fish, is my relative clause because it starts with the relative pronoun which. Another relative pronoun we need to know about is whose. This refers to something that belongs to his or hers or theirs, okay? So if I had the sentences, my dog is called Murphy, his coat is very fluffy, I'm going to swap the pronoun his for the relative pronoun whose, I'm going to embed that second clause into the first clause and I get the sentence, my dog, whose coat is very fluffy, is called Murphy. So the relative clause there is whose coat is very fluffy because it starts with the relative pronoun whose, and I can read around it and it still makes sense. Next up, we can have where and there. <laughs> it's all rhyming. So if I take two simple sentences, Red Brick Hayes is the best school, we go there, the place there, to learn. I'm going to swap that for where, the relative pronoun, and my new sentence says, Red Brick Hayes, where we go to learn, is the best school true that. Next up, we have the relative pronoun when. Now, when refers to any time or date um, or day, any, any time that you're talking about. So, if I take the sentences in 2018, I started teaching at Redbrook Hayes. I was 23 years old. I can now embed that second clause into my first clause with the relative pronoun when. So, in 2018, which is the place that I was talking about in the first sentence, when I was 23 years old, so it's telling me that I was 23 in 2018, I started teaching at Red Brick Hayes. So if we look at those, they're all following the same pattern. I've taken the second sentence, I've reworked it, and I've embedded it into the first sentence. Along with who, that means we've talked about five different relative pronouns, but we know there are a few more. These are the main ones that we come across in year six. If you're unsure which relative pronoun to use, a good tactic is to just read it aloud and check that it makes sense. So, for example, if I take the first uh, combined sentences about minnows, 
if I'm writing and I'm thinking, mm, what do I swap they for? Try it. Try it with different ones. So let's try the sentence with whose, for example. Minnows, whose are a type of small fish, swim in shoals. That doesn't sound quite right. So I'm going to try a different relative pronoun. Other relative pronouns that you I think it cut me off there. Sorry, still getting used to this distance teaching. Um, but other relative pronouns that you might need to, uh, to be aware of are ones like whatever, which is year six's favourite relative pronoun, whatever, whichever, whoever, whom, that, um, thatever, those ones. Are these all kind of ringing a bell? I'm hoping so. Now, if you would like, I know you love all these random songs I find on the internet, a really cool relative clauses video with two chaps called Max and Harvey who look like super cool dudes there. Um, I, I'm not sure who they are, but I, I've been told that they are celebrities of some sort. Um, if you would like to see this video, um, please go to the BBC Super Movers website or you can just type into Google Key Stage 2 English colon relative clauses with Max and Harvey. Um, and you can have a little sing and dance to a song about relative clauses. I know you really want to. So pause this video here, head over to the BBC Supermovers and enjoy. Well, I sincerely hope that we all really enjoyed dancing along to that video. A little bit catchy there. Um, now we're going to use that information that Max and Harvey gave us and the bit of waffle I did before to answer some questions to do with relative clauses. So if you find it easier to write questions down and answer them in your notebook, you can do so. If you find them easier to just read them and answer them in your head, that is absolutely fine too. But I'm going to ask you in a moment to pause this video and then to restart it when you have finished answering these questions. So please pause the video now. OK, let's look at the answers to these questions. So in the first question, to identify the relative clause in the sentence below, the commas are a really big giveaway. OK, we're lucky that this sentence only contains one relative clause or one embedded clause. There's only one set of commas or dashes or brackets that we need to be thinking about. Another giveaway is that there is a clause that starts with the relative pronoun that. Hmm. Now, to double check that this is the relative clause, because sometimes they throw in red herrings to trick us, we need to read the sentence and then read around it. So if I read the sentence as the old house that stood on the hill for over a century was covered in ivy and moss. OK, so it makes sense the whole sentence together. I can tell because there's some commas and there's a different clause. Let's read around it to check that this, the main clause makes sense without the relative clause in there. So the old house was covered in ivy and moss. Makes sense by itself. So that tells me that the underlying section there is the relative clause. For question number two, um, remember that tactic that I mentioned a few moments ago in the video, that if you're unsure which relative pronoun to use, try a few out. So Sid, when is a good runner, is competing in a race on Sunday. That doesn't make sense. Sid, which is a good runner, is competing in a race on Sunday. When we use things, uh, when we use the relative pronoun which, it tends to be referring to an object, not a person. When we're referring to a person, we need to be using the relative pronoun who. So let's try it out. Sim, Sid, who is a good runner, is competing in a race on Sunday. That sounds right, so I'm going to go with who. Well done if you got that one right. And the last one, we need to be looking for a relative clause to go on the end of this sentence. Now, this one was sneaky because the relative clauses, we know they can go embedded in the middle of a sentence, but here it is at the end of a sentence. So be aware that it pops up in different locations within the sentence. So we only have one comma to indicate this clause because we wouldn't need a comma and then straight away full stop on the end of the sentence. That wouldn't be correct. So we just have the one comma here to separate the main clause and the relative clause at the end. So I'm going to read through these sentences and think which one makes sense to me. So I passed her a large glass of water when she drank instantly. So if she was already drinking, why would I pass her a glass of water? That doesn't make sense. I passed her a large glass of water 
which she drank instantly. Mm, that could be it, because which is referring to the object, the large glass of water, which is what we're talking about. Let's try the last one just to make sure. I passed her a large glass of water where she drank instantly. Now, where we know rep refers to a place. Um, and we're not really talking about a place, so it can't be that one, so it must be the second. Well done if you got that. Okay, here are three more questions. Please pause the video at your convenience and restart it when you are ready to answer the questions. Okie dokie, let's whiz through the answers to those three questions. A little bit trickier these ones than the last one, so well done if you persevered and found them a bit harder. So, my first sentence is asking me to link two different fragments together to make um, two lots, sorry, to link four fragments together in twos to create two different sentences, which I've linked together using the relative pronouns who and where. So if I look at the fragments first of all to decide which goes with which, if I take the first bit, the footballer, I'm not then going to start talking about penguins or the Antarctic Ocean. I'm going to think, right, footballer, goal, mm, those two linked together, the Antarctic Ocean, penguins. Okay, so I hope we've all been able to go and link those two fragments together. And next, if I need to decide which relative pronoun fits where. So I'm going to read the sentences together using that tactic we just talked about of trying out the two pronouns. So the footballer, who was called Sam, scored a goal. That fits because who is talking about a person, the person being Sam, the footballer. I'm going to try the second one just to make sure. The footballer where was called Sam, scored a goal. Doesn't make sense because where the pronoun refers to a place. We're not talking about a place there, we're talking about a person. So the correct pronoun there would be who. For the second one, we can use the pronoun, the relative pronoun where. The Antarctic Ocean, where, that's what we're talking about, the place, the Antarctic Ocean, the location. Um, the Antarctic Ocean, where penguins live, is cold all year. So the two relative clauses in those sentences would be who was called Sam and where penguins live. Okay, without those two clauses in those sentences, the, the sentences still make sense. The footballer scored a goal. The Antarctic Ocean is cold all year. But we've added that extra information, we've embedded it in the middle. Next up, we have to rewrite the two sentences below as one sentence using the pronoun that. So we've already got the pronoun. We don't need to decide which pronoun we're using. We need to look at the sentence and think, right, which bit works where? So here we're talking about the cake. The cake was lovely. We ate the cake on Monday. So I'm going to use that to replace the cake in one of those sentences. So we could have the sentence, the cake that we ate on Monday was lovely. OK, we've used the word that, the relative pronoun that, to replace the cake, to replace the subject in that second sentence. And the last question is an explanation one. So well done if you've written this down. Well done if you've thought about it and answered it in your mind. Either way is good. So would the sentence below make sense if you remove the underlined section? The golden ticket, when you receive it, needs to be opened in front of me. So let's try it without that underlined section. The golden ticket, when you receive it. When you receive it, what? Like, it's not a finished idea, is it? We're talking about when. So when something is happening, something else needs to be happening. But we've only got one action actually happening receiving the ticket. I wonder if there is a section in that sentence that could be removed and the rest of the sentence made sense. Think about what we know about relative clauses. What can we do to them or what can happen to them? And the sentence still makes sense. Oh yeah, relative clauses can be removed from a sentence and the main clause still makes sense around it. So where's the relative clause in this sentence? when you receive it. Starts with the relative pronoun when. Mm? So let's read around that. The golden ticket needs to be opened in front of me. That still makes sense. So my answer to this question would be no. The underlined section is needed for this sentence to make sense. However, 
if we remove the relative clause when you receive it, the sentence would still make sense. So the person who has written the sentence and underlined it has underlined the wrong part of the sentence. Well done if you got that right and you explained it. Good job. Okay, final note before we move on is positioning. So we um, have been looking at relative clauses embedded into um, sentences, but we know by looking at a couple of the sentences before and a couple of the questions that relative clauses can also be in different positions within the sentence. So here's my first example of, a, of a, an embedded relative clause. The cake that we ate on Monday was lovely. That is embedded because it's in the middle of the main clause. There's a bit of main clause before, there's a bit of main clause after, and it's snuggled up in bed, it's wrapped up in that due day. However, we know that relative clauses can also go at the end of a sentence. So I am going to high school next year, which will be very exciting. So we've just used the one comma in that sentence, because like we said before, if we have a comma and then a full stop straight after, it's going to look a bit shabby, okay? So it's not grammatically correct to put a comma and a full stop. So I don't need that second full stop. The reason we have commas in the sentences is to separate the clauses, to keep our clauses independent from each other. That's so when you're reading it, you know to take a minute pause or to change the intonation of your voice if you're reading aloud. So, for example, if I say the cake that we ate on Monday was lovely. I'm pausing just for a fraction of a second at those commas. I'm separating those clauses out. If I read the second one, I am going to high school next year, which will be very exciting. I've changed the intonation a bit more, shown that it's getting more exciting. And once again, there is that minute pause. Because we've got a full stop on the end, that's the end of the idea. We pause there naturally when we read anyway. So we don't need a comma to say, oh, minute pause again, because we've already separated it. It's the end of the sentence. That makes sense? Cool. So your next task is to write me a few relative clauses in your school book. So I would like you to use this picture where there is a million and one things going on. I would like you to use some relative clauses. There is a list to the right hand side of the screen of some relative clauses. But if you would like to use some that aren't on there, such as whatever, whichever, whatever, whoever, you can do too. I've done two examples for you. So if we look at this chap over here, fly kite, my sentence would be the young boy is flying a kite, which has a red and yellow design on it. There I have used the relative pronoun which to start my relative clause and my relative clause is at the end of the sentence. Now if we look at this napping little man over here and the snooze, my sentence is the man who had an orange crab on his stomach was wearing polka dot shorts. My relative pronoun is who and my relative clause is embedded, so it's in the middle of the sentence, it's not at the end like the first one. I would like you to try and vary the relative pronouns that you're using, and I would like you to try and change up where the relative clause is within the sentence. So some embedded, some at the end. So in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to pause your video and have a go at that. Okie dokie, my lovelies. So we are going to be looking at a specific purpose of writing this next couple of weeks. So on the PDF document that is um, linked to this video, there are a few examples of writing. Some of them have been written by previous year six students and some of them are published formats of writing. I would like you to have a look at them. Pause the video in a second, second and think about what is the purpose of this text, not what genre of text is it, what, what is the purpose? Why has the author sat down and written these texts? I'll give you a clue. We've looked at it in school before. So it's a purpose of writing that we've looked at a little while ago. Pause the video now and read through those examples really carefully. Just a little note about the ones written by children. All of them are an expected English level for year six and a couple of them are greater depth. So maybe have a think as you're reading, which one would you put as greater depth and which one would you put as expected? 
pause the video now. Okie dokie, so if we're playing the video again, that means we've got an idea of what we think the purpose of these texts is for. What I would like you to do now is in the book that you were given from school, I would like you to draw out this um, expanding success criteria. So you've seen this before, we use it in English lessons, we've got a big version on the board at the back of the classroom that I write on and we scribble all our ideas and all the bits that we find when we're doing an explore lesson in English. So I'd like you to create your own in your book now. If you want to turn your book so it is landscape, you can do so. And in the centre of that expanding success criteria, in the box that says purpose, I'd like you to write down the purpose you think um, all of those texts have in common. So they've all got one main purpose in common. So please pause the video now and do that. Okay, so now I'm going to reveal to you the purpose. So if you haven't written it down, quickly pause and write it down. But the main purpose of all these texts is to inform the reader. So they are passing on information about one subject or another to the reader. They are informing the reader. Do you remember this purpose that we've looked at before? Yeah, well done if you got that right. That's really tricky to realise the purpose of some text. So if you've got that right, very impressed. Very impressed as well if you've used the word inform and remembered that. Well done, you. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to I'm going to ask you to look at the different techniques the author has used. So I'd like you to focus just on text A. So it's one about um, different humans, early examples of what has developed and become Homo sapiens humans today. This is a greater depth text. So it's from a previous year six pupil. And it is a piece of writing that has been graded as greater depth. So it's a really good one to look at if you're wanting that greater depth grading at the end of the year. Remember that all these pieces of writing that you write now still go towards your end of year writing grade. So if you are wanting to push that great depth, this is a perfect one to look at. If you're wanting that expected level, this is a good one to look at because it's a really high level. OK, so what I'd like you to do now is look through this text. Just this one. What techniques can you find? What kind of devices have they used? Who do you think the audience is for this text? Do you think this is for small children? Do you think it's for children your age? Do you think it's for older children or adults? Why do you think that? OK, we're going to I would like you to go through this with a fine tooth comb. Any technique that you that you find, for example, I'm going to tell you that relative clauses are definitely in there. I would like you to write the technique in the next box out and then write the example that you found of the relative clause or whatever technique you find on the outer box. OK, a bit like we do on the board in the classroom. Pause the video in a second and really go to town on this. This is a brilliant example of a text. So look through, go through the fine tooth comb. What have they used to make it so good? Please pause the video now. OK, let's have a little look at some techniques that are in this text. Oh, it has got rid of everything on my screen. Bear with me, year six. You know I am the most technically illiterate human on this earth. OK, so we know the purpose is to inform. <gasps> Yay, it's working. OK, to dig on that bit. So, um, the first thing that strikes you about this text is that it uses really technical language. Lots of the language in this text will not be used in an everyday conversation, whereas like Homo agaster or primitive don't really crop up in our everyday conversations, unless you're talking about um, the evolution of man on an everyday basis, which is really cool, good scientific interest there. Um, but these are technical words, they are words that links specifically to that subject. Primitive lends itself to a few more contexts, but it is a word that specifically describes the early stages of evolution, so the beginnings of when creatures or plants start to evolve and start to change to make them more successful in their habitat. So these examples of language show that this is a really scientific paper, okay, it's talking about the idea of evolution of human beings from where they began to where they are now. 
So those words show me that it's scientific. It up levels it. It shows me that the audience is maybe a little bit more um, intellectual than uh, maybe if this was aimed for reception children. It's going to be a little bit more developed, um, a little bit more scientific knowledge going into this. We can see that they have used colons to define some of their technical language. So if I look at the first two paragraphs, they have got colons to define the different uh, evolutionary stages of man. So Homo habilis has a colon and then the definition or the explanation of what a Homo habilis person would have been or would have looked like or why they were different to Homo sapiens or humans that we know of today. So they've used this colon to define, to explain one of those examples of technical language. Now they've done this really well for the first two paragraphs, but the last three seem to be missing their colon, which is a shame. But because they have demonstrated that they can use a colon to define technical language, that means that the moderator said, yes, brilliant, well done, they've used that successfully, they've used it with impact. That's fine, that's like one of the things ticked off their list to get them greater depth. Now, rhetorical question, it's half purple and half green. Hmm, I wonder why I've used a different colour. I wonder if you can remember back to our English lessons in school and I swapped colour and that's because there's a second sneaky purpose. Okay, so we have the purpose here to engage. So to keep the reader interested in what they are reading, not to get down on one knee and propose the ring, but to keep them reading, to keep that engagement, to keep that interest. So we know that rhetorical questions link really, really well to our reader and help draw them in. So the author of this text has done this very well. They've used a rhetorical question to hook in the reader. They're asking a question directly to the reader. They're not getting an answer, which is why it's a rhetorical question. But as well, it's also given a fact. It's also still informing the reader. It's telling us that the first ever version of man was bent over with a curved back. It's given us a fact and hooking us in at the same time. Really high level technique use. Next up, we have used a semi, well, I haven't used, or you haven't used, somebody else has used, a semicolon to link two main clauses together. So, oh no, my, oh no, I'm going to have to put a little dot because my semicolon did not copy. There you go. So on that sentence, we have got the semicolon to link the two clauses together. So he used, um, he used his arms and legs to walk. He did not walk like we do today. Two independent ideas joined together, not with a conjunction, but with a semicolon. Now you will remember from me constantly harping on you that that semicolon used there is a greater depth statement. So one of the reasons why this paper has been deemed greater depth, because they have used a semicolon to link two main clauses really, really well. So if you're after greater depth, start thinking about that. Now I'm going to highlight to you the words did not. Hmm. What could they have used instead of did not? You can always contract those words together to make didn't. I wonder why they didn't use didn't. Hmm. <gasps> because it's formal language. Okay, so we know that formal language does not use contractions. So therefore, they've separated those two words, they've expanded them out into two separate independent sentence, um, words, sorry, um, to show that this is a more formal paper. So we know that this piece of writing is talking to somebody um, who is um, a formal, maybe a bit more of a mature reader. Because it's a scientific paper using a lot of technical language, this speaks directly to maybe an older teenager starting to read this paper. The, formal, the formality of it has been stepped up. Once again, showing that you can um, think about the audience and whether you need to be thinking about formal language or informal language is a great depth statement. So make sure you're thinking about who is the audience of your paper if you're going to start writing these. Do you need formal or informal language to show that audience? Next up, they have used fronted adverbs to create cohesion within their text. I'm always talk about cohesion and how the paper flows. I can imagine you all doing the little wiggly action that I'm doing now whenever I say cohesion and flow. So um, they've used two transitional adverbs, furthermore and however, that 
add on to or contrast a previous idea. They're linking back to that idea. They have also used um, the front of the verbial surprisingly, which is just a normal front of the verbial, just saying, oh, surprisingly, blah, blah, blah. It's just adding a bit more variety into how they are structuring their sentences. Okay, they have used parenthesis. They have used parenthesis with um, commas. They've used parenthesis with brackets, as shown here, 2.5 million years ago. And they have used parenthesis with dashes instead of vegetables, blah, 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 blah. Um, <clears throat> these two examples were both found in the second paragraph. So if you want to look at the rest of the sentence and surrounding that, the second paragraph is where I got those two examples from. Parentheses we know adds extra information to a sentence that it doesn't necessarily need, but because we're informing our author and our reader, we want to give them more and more information. So a good use of parentheses is squeezing in, eking in a little bit more information that we can present to our reader. Next up, they have used inverted commas. Now, normally when we look at inverted commas, it's because somebody is speaking or we are recanting something that's said in a quote. However, here they've used them almost not quite sarcastically, but to show that they don't mean that. So when we talk about man or human, we talk about humans that we know today, homo sapiens. But here they're using human and man to refer to more primitive versions of homo sapiens. So they're doing man and they're that's their like little quotation marks that you do with your fingers when you're in a conversation that I can't show you right now because I'm not on video. But I'm doing those little bunny ear quotation. It's almost sarcastic. Like they're saying, oh, man, although this man, we don't normally call a man because he was around 500,000 years ago. Um, but I'm going to use that because if I keep repeating homo augusta or homo habilis, it's going to get tedious. So they've used man to kind of emphasize that word, to show that we don't really mean that but we can use it to explain what we're saying in an easier way for our reader. So other than front of the verbials, they have also used cohesive devices. Oh, I was missing a word, devices. I do apologize. To link to previous paragraphs or to previous sentences within paragraphs. So if we look at, I think it's the second last paragraph, not in the trees like the creatures before them. Now, that bit on the end, that clause at the bottom, like the creatures before them, and links to the previous paragraphs where the author has explained the previous before uh, the previous creatures before them and has explained that they live in trees. And now they're going, oh, this person doesn't live in trees or this type of human, sorry, doesn't live in trees like the creatures and um, unlike the creatures before them. So they're linking it to the previous more primitive examples of Homo sapiens. So then writing a paragraph and they're not, and they're using those be beautiful front of verbs to link in between those paragraphs, but then they're not ignoring it for the rest of the text. They're referring back to it. Now you'll notice only one or two examples of this within the text. We don't need to constantly do it, but to link those ideas back, if you're talking about one um, location where one creature lives and another location where another creature lives and you can, they're two separate say, uh, sentences, but if we can link back to them, that shows a far more advanced style of writing. OK, and we have also used relative clauses, like I told you at the beginning. Um, so this one was, I believe, in the last paragraph. So it's starting with the relative pronoun, which it doesn't have to be there because the main clause before it makes sense by itself. But it's adding a little bit more information. So we found lots and lots of features in that text. So there are other things that you may have found as well, slightly more organisational features, but they help us to inform the reader. So things like diagrams or photographs. These help us inform the reader by showing us what the author is talking about. So making it clear. Um, if you're talking about Homo habilis and you're describing it, I'm going to get a much better picture when I see that diagram on the side. I'm like, oh, yeah, it was slightly more bent over than humans are today. So it's helping to inform the reader with diagrams and photographs. We know that titles, so we have to imagine, I always imagine information text in a big old non-fiction book. And you're flicking through, trying to find out about your favorite animal in the world, the Mexican walking fish. 
and you're scanning through, clicking through, and then bam, there's that big bold title at the top, Mexican walking fish. And Miss Tucker goes, that's my favorite animal, gonna read about that. That's what I was looking for. So those big bold titles help the reader when it is in the format of a book to look through and to find what they need to be reading about. Subheadings help that even more. So if I'm looking at a text about Mexican walking fish and I need to know exactly what Mexican walking fish eat, I don't need to know about where they live, don't need to know about what beautiful colours they come in, I need to know specifically what they eat. I'm going to scan to that Mexican walking fish page using the title and then I'm going to scan down the page and find the subheading that says something like diet or what do Mexican walking fish eat? And I know that's the bit I need to read. So these organisational features help to inform the reader. They give them a quick, easy access to the information that they need. Now, sometimes in the text, we find words that are in bold. That is because they are technical language that might not have been um, defined by using a colon. They may not have been defined by using parentheses. Instead, they are defined in the glossary. We know that information texts often have a glossary or a small section of the page that is dedicated to defining some technical language. When you're using a book, the glossary is normally in the back. Some of the texts may use bullet point lists with, to organise information. Um, and some of them may use numbered lists or timelines if they are explaining a sequence, a process. So if I had an information text telling me how to make pancakes, I would have a numbered list so I know that I do the, uh, mix the egg with the flour before I put it in the frying pan, otherwise I've just got burnt flour. And the last thing, which this text did not do, um, but a lot of texts do that are information text, is a short introduction paragraph. So just a short paragraph explaining briefly what the text is about. Oh, a little flash there. Okay, so my job for you now is to have a look at the other texts. Can you find an example of these features in them? And can you find any more features or techniques that you might like to include when we get around to writing? So we are going to use this page that you've written down in your book, all of this information. If you want to add to it with these points, please do. And I would like you to look through, is there anything else that you could include? So have a look through all the pieces of writing, what are the techniques can you find? Can you find any more examples, any better examples, any different techniques, any other purposes, I wonder? Have a look through because this is going to be your cheat sheet, your crib sheet when you start writing. So please pause the video now and crack on with that. Okie dokie then, year six, right. We are now going to start our new connected curriculum topic for this term which is a little bit strange because I don't think I've ever launched a connected curriculum topic um, without being there and having a really fun day and dressing up and, and I'm baking. We often end up baking. So I do apologise if it's over the internet, but it's quite an interesting topic. I'm quite excited to get our teeth into it. So a virtual drum roll, please. Your next topic is survival from stones to steel. So it's all about the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. We've just looked at early, or oh, primitive, we know that word, versions of humans in our English, and now we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail. So there are two really good videos that I'd like you to have a look at. There are links to them in the PDF that goes along with this video. One looks like this on YouTube. And the other one looks like this. Now, one of them is seven minutes and one of them is 13 minutes and 11 seconds. Um, the first one you're going to have to bear with. It's got a bit of an annoying narrator voice. But after listening to me waffle on for so long, I think you'll be fine. Um, the second one is the Horrible Histories um, clips that are all linked together. So we're going to start off by looking at just the Stone Age. Because this is such a big um, expanse of time that we're going to just look at the first section of the Stone Age, which even still is like millions of years long. So on the PDF that goes along with this video, there's the link to these two videos, which I'd like you to watch first. And then I would like you to look at the other links that I've put on there as well. And there is also um, a PowerPoint presentation on the end of the PDF as well, um, which have all got information about the Stone Age. Now, I'd like you to look specifically to start off with with different 
dwellings where people lived so um what kind of homes they had who they lived with did they live as families or big villages did they live alone that kind of thing you're going to need this information for tomorrow to link to our english so if you could spend a little bit of time now watch the videos jot down a few notes use your book or your little jotter book whichever you would like but random bit of paper whatever um you could even type it up if you're feeling a bit fancy but you need some information on the different dwellings of people throughout the stone age so we split the stone age into three different time uh phases which will become um evident as you research on and i would like you to think about how houses developed over those years so that is your collective curriculum topic for today to research and to make notes about the different types of houses for people during the stone age not the bronze age not the iron age just the stone age cool enjoy there it's quite an interesting topic i think you'll really like this and that year six brings us to the end of our first digitalized lesson um mrs Perry and i hope you've really enjoyed it and it's been beneficial and hopefully almost as good as us being in the room and being able to show you things and respond to questions instantly um but if you have any suggestions for how we can improve these videos please drop us an email or if you've got any questions about today's learning please 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 don't sit there and get all confuddled over it drop an email and we'll help the best that we can so the email to get us is year six at redbrookhays.staffs.sch.uk but there is a link to that on the pdf document as well um to save you trying to type it all out you have also got um, a connected curriculum menu. So we'd like you to complete roughly two activities a week. You can pick and choose which ones you do. One of your activities will be today's activity for this week. So you've already done one if you've done today's learning. So well done. If you would like more practice, we've got Prodigy Maths, Splash Maths and TT Rockstars, which are all uh, websites that we've used before you have also got a link down here on the bottom right to some extra maths so white rose maths is an amazing um, company that are completely free to use and they are updating their website daily with home learning videos so there's videos and tasks on there and they're a really really good um, company that um, teaches maths and develops schemes of work so have a look on there every day if you'd like some extra maths practice um, you have also got Comma Castle, which I know a few use. You put my teeth back in that a few of you have used before Easter, which is a really good way to practice your spag and your punctuation, especially. And then today, being released today, woo, shiny and new, is the BBC Bite Size Home Learning. So every day, BBC will release lessons for specific year groups. So if you go to BBC Bite Size, go on Home Learning. I'm sure it'll all be very big and jazzy. Um, and you can go to the year six section and they've got daily videos up there because it's only being released today i don't know what kind of lessons they'll have on there um but my experience with bbc bite size is it's normally really high quality learning so i'm sure they've done an excellent job so have a look, little 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 look oh i'm gonna stop the video I'm getting all tongue-tied uh, <laughs> have a little look on there and let me know how you get on drop mrs perry and i an email or use our Padlet website which I've explained about in another video um, to share with us your learning. Mrs Perry and I are missing you all very very much so any learning that you've done if you just want to say hey please drop an email um, or use Padlet just to let us know that this, we're not talking to just our computers there are people on the other side. Um, we miss you lots stay safe and we will see you all very soon. Bye year six!